ready? Yes, we're all ready. Okay, we can start now. Yeah. I would like to begin by reading out a statement, which in return, I would ask the judges and counsel to confirm is correct. I hope that is okay. Yeah, please do. The appeal hearing is being held by way of video conference. Any orders or directions made after or during the course of this hearing will be issued by the registry in Dubai on the appeal bench instructions. Will the judges and parties representatives please confirm that the situation is as I have stated? Yes, I confirm. Yes, yes. I agree. Thank you, Roger Bowden. Thank you very much. We're here for a hearing in the matter of CA005-2020 before Chief Justice Zaki Azmi, Justice Roger Giles, and His Excellency Justice Shamlan Sawalhi. The appellant is represented by Hadith and Partners. Lead counsel is Edward Kemp. The respondent is represented by Banks Legal Consultancy. Lead counsel is Roger Bowden. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Kemp. Hello, Mr. Kemp. Mr. Kemp, are you there? Your Honours, um, um, uh, may it please the court, I appear on behalf of the appellant Swift Dubai Limited and Mr. Bowden appears on behalf of the respondent, Mr. Bassam Ali Khalifa. As will be clear, this is an appeal against judgment on preliminary issues of His Excellency Justice Omar Al Mahari, dated the 8th of April 2020. Permission to appeal was granted in respect of all four grounds of appeal by His Excellency on the 8th of July 2020. Now, um, there are five issues in this appeal. Uh, wait, 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 before, before, before you start. How are these uh, reference or uh, seeking application to hear on the preliminary issues? Was that your idea or the party's idea or was it the idea of the judge? Um, we uh, made an application for that um, and then that was considered at the CMC uh, and then ordered and directed at the CMC in November. So that was on the application of the parties? It, it was. It was an application of the um, of, on behalf of the defendants. But were you? Did you realize then that uh, there was a possibility of uh, the facts not being properly agreed upon as a result of which uh, whatever decision the judge of first instance gave will have to be dependent on the finding of certain facts. Well, Your Honour, the, the, the rationale behind um, the um, seeking of a trial on the preliminary issues was that the case raised fundamentally issues of jurisdiction uh, and construction of the law rather than um, any real issues of fact between the parties that couldn't be dealt with by way of the statements of case. And so um, that, that's um, the, the, the rationale behind the drawing up of the preliminary issues that were um, uh, ordered at the CMC in November. Yeah, but but uh, you, you, if you read the judge's uh, judgment, he 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 decided not to make uh, any conclusion or give any opinion on the certain issues because he said he has to dive into the facts in order to make a decision on those issues. It, it, well, yes, but um, the um, the appeal is against his declarations on the legal issues um, uh, arising. Um, and, um, and, and the grounds of appeal are directed at, at those. And so, if I may um, outline the five issues that are raised by this appeal, and then what okay. I intend to do is, um, is, is give you the, the outline of my submissions before um, moving into those submissions. Okay. Um, the, first, the five issues are these. Firstly, whether whistleblowing protection in Article 64.3c of the operating law can apply to the claimant given that all of his alleged disclosures were made before the operating law came into force. The second issue under the operating law is, if so, does Article 40 of the operating law provide a right to damages for breach of Article 64.3c of the operating law? Okay, before we proceed, 
can you, uh, whoever is submitting and referring to documents, have those documents uh, exhibited on the CMS so that we had, don't have to struggle to look for them as you are submitting? You have um, people assisting with you there? Your Honor, Did Maitha explain to you our request? Yes, uh, Your, Your Honour, when I um, take you in due course to pages in the e-bundle, I'll direct you to the pages in the e-bundle. We don't actually have um, any hard copy bundles, and so in due course I will, uh, Your Honour, take you to uh, the page. No, no, what, 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 I mean, what I mean, can, have, can you have those pages exhibited on the screen? Don't, uh, don't ask me to look for bundle so and so, page so and so, you know. It takes time for us to to retrieve them from the from the electronic uh, system. Yes, of course, um, I, I want to read on the screen as you submit. I want to read the screen without having to look for them. I, without having to type bundle such and such and uh, whatever it is for them to come out. Well, you, you, Your Honour, I'm, I'm simply um, I've got a speaking note, but. Um, it, this isn't oh, on okay. the baseline system, um, uh, uh, um, but in due course, when I refer you to documents on the case line system, I will of course give you the, the okay. correct okay. page number. Okay, yes, yeah. please go on. Those are, issues, go on. those are the two issues of law under the operating law. Um, the third issue is whether the claimant made, it's a different point now, whether the claimant made binding concessions at the CMC in November that were not yes. withdrawn trial, such as to preclude his claim for bonus and penalty. Um, the fourth issue um, is um, whether the judge held there was a liability in respect of penalty under Article 18 of the previous employment law, and if so, whether that holding can stand absent any finding as to the effective termination date. And finally, um, the final issue is whether the judge's conclusion that the claimant's contract was terminated under Clause 3 of his contract meant, in light of the nature of the defence advanced by the claimant, that there was no longer any tribal issue in respect of the defendant's counterclaim. Um, so those are the five issues. Um, now, one point, um, uh, Your Honours, to mention is that the respondent has, has chosen not to file a respondent's notice in this case. And so we say that in accordance with RDC 4478, he must be taken as relying only on the reasons given by His Excellency for his reserved decision. He's not entitled, we say, to run any new or additional points. Um, but I just want to flag that up at this opening stage. Um, Your Honours, the first two issues, um, the issues under the operating law, will take up by far the mo most of the court's time. And this is the first case under the whistleblowing protection provision in the operating law uh, that's been considered by the court. And in respect of the first two issues, what I intend to do is firstly provide an outline of the legal framework. And there, Your Honours, I'll take you to the relevant provisions of the operating law in the e-bundle uh, on case lines. I'll then uh, take you through some paragraphs um, of His Excellency's decision below to show the treatment of the relevant provisions by the court below. I'll then um, outline the proper approach to the construction of the provisions, and there we may descend into some of the authorities in the appellant authorities bundles on construction and also extrinsic aids to construction. And I'll give you now my first my submissions on those first two issues, which are these. Um, firstly, whistleblowing protection in Article 64.3c of the operating law cannot apply to the claimant because all of his disclosures were made before the law came into force. The law, as we'll go on to see, uses the present tense, makes a disclosure or makes disclosure. We say, uh, applying the ordinary rule of interpretation, that looks to the future, i.e. after the law has come into force. And there's also a presumption against retrospective effects of the statute. And we say, that first issue provides a complete answer to the uh, claim under the operating uh, law. Secondly, and in any event, we submit there's no right to damages because Article 4.3c is explicitly a protection and Article 40 of the operating law 
uh, which provides a right to damages, a right to damages for breach of statutory duty, is not expressed as applying to breaches of a protection. And so therefore we say um, a, a claim for damages cannot be brought um, under the operating law. I propose then uh, to give somewhat briefer submissions on the remaining issues three, four, and five. So if I can begin now, Your Honours, by taking you through um, the legal framework on the operating law. Um, this is a law that came into force on the 12th of November, 2018. And if we can start with um, 0167 of the authorities bundle, please, Your Honours. 0167. This is uh, the whistleblower protection provision in the operating law. Um, the starting point is that um, at 64 subsection 1, the provision applies to a person who makes a disclosure. And we also see at article 64.3, subsection 3, where a person makes disclosure we then see at A, B, and C of subsection three, that that then gives the person an entitlement to a defense from legal or contractual liability, that's in A, at B, a defense against enforcement, um, and C, um, this is the provision in issue in this case, the protection from dismissal from current employment or detriment by the employer or related party of the employer. So the point to make about um, makes a disclosure or makes disclosure is that the language of the present tense, Your Honours, is clear and it's unambiguous and it applies only to those disclosures made on or after the law came into force. Otherwise, we say, um, the ruler would have to use the past tense made a disclosure or the expression any disclosure and that's the construction that really that the claimant would urge upon you to make his case work um, under these provisions and so the short answer on the operating law point we say is that as all of the claimant's disclosures were made before the law came into force i.e prior to the 12th of november 2019 Article 64.3c protection simply cannot bite. And that's our primary position in this appeal on the operating law. Um, if I may then outline um, the position on Article 40, um, I'll turn now to 0158. Uh, can, can, can you remind me the dates, the relevant dates? Uh, where, when did the order... Uh, the, the, the new law come into force? It came into force on the 12th of November, um, 2019. 12th of November? 12th of November, 2000, what was it? 2018. 2018, 2018. 2018. And uh, the dispute between the, the, the employee and the employers took place when? When, when did it take place? Um, well, Your Honours, the disclosures that the claimant made, the alleged disclosures, yes, yes. Made, um, uh, in the first alleged disclosure, November 2017, um, for your reference, Your Honour, that's section 8.1 of the particulars of claim. Um, November 2017. First alleged disclosure. Second alleged disclosure, January 2018. The January third alleged disclosure. Yes. Your Honour, the third alleged disclosure, the 6th of February 2018. Yeah. The fourth alleged disclosure, February to August 2018. And the yes. fifth alleged disclosure, October 2018. Mm. And one gets that from section 8.1 to section 8.5 of the particulars of claim, Your Honour. Mm. Um, the, the claimant's dismissal, I should say, um, uh, was um, there's a dispute as to, as to the precise date, 
we say the 17th of February 2019, and the claimant says it was uh, the 19th of February 2019. But, but Your Honour, all of the alleged disclosures in this case were, were, done, were, were allegedly done prior to the operating law coming into force, and therefore, as such, we say Article 64 3C protection simply cannot bite. And that's the end of the matter, we say. It's as simple as that on the operating law. In other words, you are saying that operating law does not act retrospectively. Indeed. It acts only for the future, which is normally the law unless there is a special provision or unless the law, there's a reason why we should read the law to, to act retrospectively. Indeed, Your Honour. And we say there, there, is, there is no uh, reason to, to, to um, go, go uh, beyond the clear and unambiguous words uh, makes uh, a disclosure um, that have been used by the ruler. Um, so, in this respect, if we make a decision to say that the law does, does, does not apply to the employee, to the, the, to the what they call the whistleblowing uh, by the employee uh, prior to 12 November 2018, then the respondent's case will fall, fall off. Yes, the, the claim under the operating law cannot be pursued because um, it would it would be it would fall to be dismissed by this court, uh, Your Honour. Then we don't have to consider the other issues. We don't need to consider the issue under Article 40. Okay. So okay. that's the shortcut, Your Honour. And um, if I may now outline the case under Article 40, if you're against me on um, this first point. Um, o one. What you do, Mr. Kemp? Um, one possible thought is your submission about retrospectivity perhaps not entirely on point because what would normally be regarded as not retrospective is the protection, the prohibition on sacking a whistleblower. But it's a separate question whether that protection applies to disclosures prior to the occurrence uh, the coming into force of the law. And that, that is also a question of construction, but I wonder whether retrospectivity plays as, plays much a part in that. Um, Your, Your Honour, um, to be to be clear, we, we put the case on the um, language used makes a disclosure and the meaning of those. Exactly. Yes. And in due course, Your Honour, I do want to take you to a case on uh, that, uh, which is called Re Barretto, which is um, not, um, it's, it's not been referred to in my skeleton arguments, but it's in the um, authorities bundle, and I will take you to a passage on that. I mean, unless you want me to take you to that now, of course, um, which simply underscores um, the, um, the rule of construction that the present tense is decisive, and what the present tense means um, is uh, it, it's looking to the future. I thought that you're actually making your submissions on your first point in full rather than just introducing it. Uh, am I wrong? Uh, you well, made I'm... submissions. If you want to support it by taking us to Reba Reto, now is the time, and then finish your first point and move on to the rest. Um, Your Honour, yes, I'll, I'll, I will do that. Um, if you just give me a moment. Um... So yes, if you, if, if uh, your honours, it's at um, O three A sixty three. Um, and this is um, a, a Court of Appeal of England and, and Wales case. And, and what it concerned was um, a confiscation order regarding the proceeds of drug trafficking um, and whether there was a power under a 1990 Act um, that was exercisable regarding an order made before the enactment came into force. Um, answer, no. And Lord Justice Stoughton um, he deals with the presumption against retrospective effects of the statute, uh, 03A72, um, which is 
um, uh, paragraph uh, 03A 72 um, C to G um, and uh, reaches a conclusion that the presumption would apply in that case but then he goes on to consider the ordinary words of the statutes and this is the passage that we rely on at 03A 73 The tense which the statute uses is the legislative present. In the ordinary way, it refers to the future. And then further down, when the present tense is used, it looks to the future. And so the conclusion was that um, because Section 16 of the 1990 Act required the confiscation order should be made in the future, on the ordinary language of the statute, even without the presumption of rep against retrospectivity, it didn't apply where the confiscation order was made in the past. And so we say this is on point here, makes a disclosure, is looking to the future, on or after the, the disclosures, on or after the law came into force. That's the ordinary meaning of the words. And therefore, that precludes a claim by the claimant under the operating law because all of his alleged disclosures were made in the past. And so on an ordinary construction of the uh, uh, provisions in Article 64, we say the, the, the claimant's case under the operating law um, can, cannot be sustained and falls to be dismissed. Yes, thank, um, you. thank you. Your Honours, if I may now um, move on to the Article 40 point. Um, and um, we go back to the operating law, and the reference now is 0158, uh, Your Honours. Article 40, orders for compensation. Um, the first point, uh, Your Honours, to make on this provision is that clearly Article 40 does not apply to every breach of the operating law. It applies only to breaches of a requirement, duty, prohibition, responsibility or obligation. A protection is not there listed. We say these terms, requirement, duty, prohibition and so on, have been carefully chosen by the ruler to fix the basis of a liability for damages for breach of statutory duty under the law and legislation administered by the registrar. And we say it's important then that those terms are clear and they are certain. And, and Your Honours, each of the terms, requirement, duty, prohibition, so on, are terms of art in the operating law and in the legislation administered by the registrar. And by that we mean that when the draftsman has intended a provision to amount to such a term, requirement, duty, prohibition and so on, this has been made clear and express in the law. And there are numerous examples of this um, that I've given you um, in my supplemental skeleton argument. But if I may um, give you uh, an example of, of prohibitions um, and, and the way that's been dealt with by the op operating law. Um, Article 8.1 um, at A140, A140, Your Honours. is the prohibition against conduct of business and it's a, a prohibition we see that from the title um, to article 8 and also the language used um, in article 8 subsection 2 the prohibition but it also imposes a requirement and we see that um, from the express words used in article 8 through its subsection 3 comply with the requirements in Article 8.1. Um, so uh, clear and express language of prohibition used um, in this uh, article. 
Um, we then get another example, uh, Your Honours, um, in legislation administered by the Registrar, which is the Companies Law, um, Article 42.1 of the Companies Law, and that's at A1137. That is um, the prohibition of public offers by private companies. And um, we see that it's expressly a prohibition by the title to the article, but also the title to Article 43, um, which concerns enforcement of the prohibition, and the language used in Article 43, subsection 3, um, in respect of enforcement, the court may in the uh, A, in, in the case of an application under Article 43.1, make an order restraining the company from contravening or continuing to contravene that prohibition. So express language has been used to denote that this is a prohibition, but it also imposes requirements. We see that from Article 42, subsection 5, um, a company which fails to comply with the requirements of Article 42.1 is liable to a fine. Um, there's one further example of a prohibition, Your Honours, which is Article 79 of the Company's Law at 01161. Article 79 prohibition of financial assistance to directors. This is uh, a prohibition, as the uh, title makes plain. And, and we say as such, as with all of the other prohibitions that I've taken you to, it's within the ambit of the right to damages for breach of statutory duty in Article 40. Um, there are numerous other requirements, obligations and duties imposed by both the operating law and all of the legislation administered by the Registrar. And um, all of those terms uh, have been made express by the draftsman. Um, and I've given the court all of those references in section 11 to 13 of my supplemental skeleton argument, which is on 01139 to 01140. I don't intend to take your honours to each and every one of those provisions now because of time, but just to flag up those references there in the skeleton argument to underscore the point that in each and every case where the terms of art have been used, prohibition, duty, obligation, this has been made express in the law, in the operating law, and in the legislation administered by the registrar. Just one further example that I would like to take your honours to, which is somewhat closer to home because it's contained within the whistleblower protection provision, is a requirement, and that's the requirement on the person to make a disclosure in good faith. So if we turn back to Article 64 of the operating law, 0167, your honours, And we get um, Article 64.2c um, for the purposes of Article 64.1, the disclosure of facts made by the person shall, c, be made in good faith. And we know that that is a requirement because Article 64, subsection 4, makes, it, makes that express. We see um, Article 64, subsection 4, any person who takes any action which contravenes the requirement in Article 64.2c is liable to a uh, fine. So the draftsman has made it express that Article 64.2c is a requirement. And if you go to Part 2 of Schedule 2, which is at 0174, Your Honours, 0174, We see um, 
under the table of administrative fines, the penultimate entry cross-refers to Article 64.4, person failing to comply with whistleblowing requirements, liable to a fine of $30,000. So we say um, that a breach of that requirement can then sound not only in a fine, as, as prescribed by um, Part 2 of Schedule 2, but also sound in damages under Article 40 if there is an intentional, reckless or negligent breach of that requirement causing loss or damage to a person. The express designation of the provision as a requirement makes it actionable under Article 40. We then turn back to Article 64.3c, the provision that's an issue in this case, 64.3c, which is 0167, Your Honours. And Article 64.3c is explicitly and expressly a protection. This is so from the title of Article 64, whistleblower protection, but also from the clear and express words used in Article 64, subsection 1, is entitled to the protection set out in Article 64, 3C. So the draftsman has expressly designated Article 64, 3C as a protection. We say it is unnecessary. requirement or some other stated term for the purposes of Article 40, we submit that that cuts across the scheme of the legislation, which is that such terms have been made express, and we say that requires reading words or terms into the provision that are not on the face of the provision and or is contrary to the express language used in Article 64.1, that 64.3c is a protection. And we say that's something the court can't do. The drafter has clearly considered which of the terms applies for liability under Article 40 to be established. A protection is not there included in Article 40. If we go back to Article 40, um, on page um, 0158, breach of a protection is not there included in Article 40, subsection 1. And so the expressio unis principle of interpretation applies here. Anything not included is excluded because Article 41 does not include a protection there is no right to damages for breach of Article 64.3c. Your Honours, that is an outline of the legal framework on Article 40. If I may now um, move on to the treatment of the provisions by the court below, which we say contains numerous errors of law, and we move to the appeal bundle, uh, Your Honours. Um, so it's Page one eight, page one eight the, This is um, paragraph fourteen of um, His Excellency's judgment, the first sentence. Um, Article 40 clearly expresses that the court has an array of remedies available to it in circumstances where there has been a breach of the operating law, which the claimant alleges in this case is Article 64. That is wrong because Article 40 does not apply to every breach. It only applies to a breach of one of the prescribed terms in Article 40 got section 15 of the judgment, which is over the page on 1-9, 1-9, Your Honours. The 
last sentence of that paragraph, should the defendant be found to have breached the requirements of Article 64, dot, 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 then this court shall have the power to remedy any losses. That is also erroneous because Article 64.3c does not impose any requirement. The only requirement that is imposed by Article 64, as we have seen, is the requirement that disclosures be made in good faith in Article 64.2c, expressly designated as a requirement by Article, Article 64.4. We then get Section 16 of the judgment um, on the same page, um, the last uh, sentence there, Article 40 of the operating law is clear that any breach of Article 64, other than an innocent breach, which causes the reporter loss or damage, would give rise to a claim for damages. We say that's wrong because um, Article 40 doesn't apply to any breach of the operating law, and um, Article 4 is expressed as not applying to a breach of a protection which is what Article 64.3c expressly is. And so we say that the treatment um, by the judge below of Article 40 was in error for um, all of those reasons submitted. Um, if I may now um, take your honours to the proper approach to the construction of the, of the provisions. And um, the starting point, your honours, will of course be the Adel and Lease approach to interpretation. I don't intend to take you to those two authorities, um, but we say this. Um, we say the respondent's case on um, uh, the operating law does require modification to the language for three reasons. One, for his disclosures to be in scope, modification of the present tense to the past tense or to any disclosure to make the statute work. Secondly, for Article 64.3c to be termed a prohibition when the ruler has expressly designated it as a protection. Thirdly, for Articles 40 to include breaches of a protection when this is expressly not included in the classes of breaches that give rise to a right to damages for breach of statutory duty. We say that goes too far. It's not for the court to speculate as to the language that would have been inserted by the ruler. And therefore, um, the, the, the interpretation contended for by the respondent um, cannot be accepted um, by the court. Um, there are a few additional authorities to take your honours to. Um, firstly, on extrinsic aids to interpretation, because it's understood that the claimant now places considerable reliance on the consultation papers um, as an aid to interpretation. Um, and a couple of English authorities on that um, that are well known. Um, Black Clawson, uh, please, uh, the first authority, which is um, at A, the passage is at A, A0348, Your Honour. And this is, uh, Your Honours, the, the well-known passage of Lord Diplock at 6638 D uh, to F of that authority. Um, the acceptance of the rule of law as a constitutional principle requires that a citizen, before committing himself to any course of action, should be able to know in advance what are the legal consequences that will flow from it, where those consequences are regulated by statute, the source of that knowledge is what the statute says. In construing it, the court must give effect to the words of the statute uh, would be reasonably understood to mean by those whose conduct it regulates. So the constitutional principle of the uh, ordinary meaning of the words on the face of the legislation with the legal consequences needing to be clear and certain. Um, we then get um, the case of Spath Hole, 
which um, uh, is that the, the relevant passage is at A3A125. Um, A3A, O3A125. Uh, and um, Lord Nichols there um, at C to D uh, on that page um, uh, says that courts should, should approach the use of external aids with circumspection. The judges frequently turn to external aids for confirmation of views reached without their assistance. That is unobjectionable. But the constitutional implications point to a need for courts to be slow to permit external aids to displace meanings which are otherwise clear and unambiguous and not productive of absurdity. So uh, caution to be exercised um, with external aid to construction, the constitutional principle being that it's the uh, language used in the statute um, that um, should drive the, the, the court's uh, function in the interpretation exercise. Now, in the instant case, and, and my learned friend will no doubt take you to the consultation papers in due course, but none of them say whether or not it is envisaged that whistleblowing protection applies to disclosures made before the law comes into force. None of the consultation papers say whether or not it is envisaged that there is a right to damages for breaches of whistleblowing protection. They're silent on both of those key points. And so they don't take the interpretation issue any further forwards in our submission. They simply do not bear on the two, issue one and issue two, under the operating law. But in any event, as Black Clawson and Spathholm make clear, the consultation papers provide no substitute for the court's interpretation of the clear meaning of the words used in the law. Um, if I may now just um, give you our case on a few of the authorities relied on by the respondent. Um, I don't intend to take you to those authorities to save time, and no doubt Mr. Bowden will take you to them in due course, but I do wish to give you our case in a nutshell on a few of those cases. So one of the cases that he relies on is a UK Supreme Court case called Duty and Royal Mail which is a case, a leading case under the UK whistleblowing legislative scheme, which is contained in the Employment Rights Act 1996. And it's of no assistance to this court. That is because um, it's dealing with a different whistleblowing scheme drawn in entirely different terms to the scheme under the operating law. And in particular, the Employment Rights Act, um, as may be well known to the court, um, contains a, 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 an unfair dismissal scheme, which is not present in the DIFC. And the language used in the whistleblowing provisions is, is entirely different to those uh, used in the, in, the, in the operating law. And so we say it's of no assistance, duty, which is at A061, is of no assistance to the construction issue. Um, Mr. Bowden also seems to place some reliance on a um, court of first instance case of White House and D DFSA, which is at 06125. Um, now, that's a case under the data protection law. And, and as I understand it, 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 it appears to be um, uh, included as an authority because in that case, Mr. Justice Field um, construed a, a data protection law in accordance with the English Data Protection Act and the European Directive because the data protection law is explicitly modelled on the uh, UK equivalent, which in turn transposes a European Union directive. Um, now, the re reliance on that case here is hopelessly misconceived. Article 64 of the operating law is not modelled on the UK Employment Rights Act. 
it's not the product of any European Union directive. The European Union directive on whistleblowing postdates the operating law. It's of no assistance whatsoever in the statutory interpretation exercise of a DIFC law that is not in any sense derived from any law of any EU member state or from any EU directive. One other um, document included in the um, respondents' authorities is a paper from Transparency International that references at 06166. Now, this is a policy paper by an NGO, Transparency International, based on a summary of whistleblowing legislation in the jurisdiction surveyed. It's not a permissible aid to construction of the operating law. There's no basis whatsoever to suggest that it was in the mind of the ruler when the operating law was drafted. It's not a permissible aid to construction of the operating law. If, if the ordinary meaning of the words is not what, what was intended, it's for the ruler and not for the court to legislate. And if the paper raises policy issues, that is for the ruler to consider um, in terms of amending the law, not for the court to step in the shoes of the ruler to, to, do, to do that function. Um, Your Honours, I've given you um, already submissions on re Barreto, And so um, just to conclude on this part of the case, um, our submissions on issue, issues one and two. The language of the provisions in issue are clear and they are unambiguous. Article 64.3c protection only applies to disclosures made on or after the law came into force. Article 64.3c is explicitly a protection and Article 40 is not expressed as applying to a protection. That is the position on an ordinary construction. There's no ambiguity. There is no warrant to read words in or to hold that there is absurdity. In any event, the position is closely analogous to that of discrimination rights before the new employment law came into force. And I flag up the decision of this court in Hanarel Hertz and DIFCA um, that discrimination rights were held not to be actionable, notwithstanding the existence of a right to claim damages for breach of statutory duty in the law of damages and remedies. And, um, if I may take your honours very briefly to a, a couple of passages in that. Um, so, 0210, uh, your honours, 0210. Um, this is in uh, His Excellency Omar al uh judgment, and we have a paragraph. Is this a, a, a two one, uh, Mr. Kim? O two one zero, Your Honour. Al Hertz. Hannah Al Hertz, O two one zero, paragraph sixty seven, Your Honour. Okay, it's O two one in my list, but. Um. <laughs> um, it starts at 021, uh, Your Honour. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 The relevant passage is at 0210. Um, paragraph 67 deals with the point that there's no right to unfair dismissal in the DIFC. And His Excellency said this that the employment law. Um, has a regulatory content and is the only law that governs uh, the employee who works for any entity having a place of business in the DIFC. Therefore, there is no basis to adopt any other law 
uh, than the DIFC employment law to determine the rights of the appellant and her contractual relationship with the respondent is regulated by the DIFC employment law. And in any event, the appellant further failed to provide a right to compensation for unfair dismissal. Um, so no right uh, to unfair dismissal in the DIFC employment law, which provides a complete regulatory code for the rights uh, and the relationship in issue. And then at 02.11, uh, paragraph 79, we get the reasoning on discrimination rights, which were contained in Article 56 of the, of the old uh, DIFC employment law. Um, no, nor is there any entitlement to damages statutory or otherwise, and there is no authority under the DIFC law principle to offer the statutory right to damages arising from a breach of the DIFC employment law. So the discrimination protections in the law were not enforceable until the new employment law came into force. Um, this is the case here, uh, we submit. Um, it's, not for, it's for the ruler and not for the court to legislate to provide a remedy in respect of whistleblowing protection in employment. Um, and so we say the position is very closely analogous to that um, in respect of discrimination rights in Hannah L. Hertz. Um, there's one final additional point um, on um, this ground of appeal, which is the judge's treatment of the claimant's pleaded case on Article 40 uh, damages. Um, it's a short point, and if I can just uh, take it reasonably briefly. Um, we say that the judge at trial um, of the, on the preliminary issues was required to consider the pleaded case on Article 40 damages that was before him and not some other case that could have been advanced or might have been advanced in the future. And if we look at the state of the claimant's pleaded case on Article 40, we go to 0220 of the bundle. This is right at the end of the claimant's particulars of claim. And we get just one single reference to damages under Article 40 in the prayer section. The, the, the claimant had failed to plead any alleged conduct that engaged Article 40, any intentional, reckless or negligent conduct, which is required, another requirement um, in Article 40 for Article 40 to buy or any factual basis to support that, that, any such alleged conduct. And, and no further particulars were provided to the judge at trial. And this was a trial, not a CMC or some other interlocutory hearing. And we say the short point um, is that the issue um, that was before the judge on whether there was a, a power to grant relief um, required the judge to consider whether the court had that power on the pleaded case that was before him and not on some other case that could have been or might have been advanced in the future. And I've referenced a UK Court of Appeal case called Al Medini in my supplemental skeleton to support that proposition. I don't intend to take you to it in order to save time, but it's at um, paragraph 19 at um, uh, 01142 uh, of the bundle. And, and so we say that was a further error in the judge's treatment of the issue, but there's no need for you to go there if you're with me either on issue one, um, historic disclosures not caught by the operating law, or issue two, no right to damages, protection not included uh, in, in Article 40. And so this is very much a subsidiary point on round one. Um, Your Honours, if I may now move to an entirely different part of the appeal, which is the third issue, and the issue of concessions. And if I can begin this issue by taking Your Honours to 
the concessions that were made at the CMC in November. And uh, it may be convenient now to go to the CMC transcript, which starts at 03168. Um, one so, three. What do you say? One three. What? Uh, oh three. Oh three. One six eight. Your Honour. Uh, zero one three. What? What? What was the page okay. number again, please? Zero three. Mr. Cam. Yes, uh, Your Honour. Mr. Cam. Hear me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. It, Your Honour, it's zero three. One zero six three. Eight. One six eight. That's right, Your Honour. Okay, thank you. So the CMC on the sixth of November, um, twenty nineteen, um, the, the 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 claimant then was acting in person. Um, we say that doesn't matter. Um, for reasons that I'll go on to. But it, in terms of his concessions, um, there, were, there were three um, uh, passages where he makes concessions. 03194 uh, is the first one um, passage I want to take you to. So, his Excellency um, asks, are you claiming employment? No, I'm not claiming employment. I'm just claiming the damages and addressing to the court that they have been made a breach. And His Excellency says, OK, based on the operating law, Law 64. This is what I want to understand your case. So your claim basically is not an employment claim. And he says, it is a breach of operating law 64 specifically. Can I carry on, Your Honour? And then we get, um, uh, this is on 03195, His Excellency says, let us make it easy and simple for all of us. If you are not claiming any employment entitlement based on your contract and employment law, the answer, true. That was a clear and unequivocal concession that embraced any claim under his contract, including bonus, and any claim under the employment law, including penalty arising thereon. The, 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 these two concessions made clear the only claim that the claimant was pursuing was the claim under the operating law, Article 64. We then get at 03198. A third concession, um, 03198, His Excellency says, Mr. Bassam, again, we'll go back to square one. You are not claiming any employment entitlement, so please focus on the operating law as you think it will affect your claim. He says, I agree with you. So a further concession, no claim for any employment entitlement, whether under the contract or the employment law, the only claim that is being pursued is under Article 64 of the operating law. And we relied on those concessions in the court below and um, did so in the skeleton argument, but if I can take you to a passage in the transcript for the trial, um, this, 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 is, this is where the, the party is, uh, sorry, the respondent is appearing in person, right, before the, before, the, before the judge. That's right. He's appearing in person before the judge. Um, we, we say that that, that, is a, uh, that doesn't matter when it comes to whether he made concession. And, yeah. and they're binding. 
Um, because the same rules apply to litigants in person as they do to represented litigants in, in our submission. And we referenced that in the supplemental skeleton, um, the a case of Ogier Hall in the un, under um, article, um, under um, the overriding objective in the White Book um, at okay. 1.1. Um, uh, litigants in person are not a privileged class to whom the rules don't apply. Yes, um, yes, Andy. So, Your Honours, if I now um, take... Well, one minute, Mr. Kemp, before, before we go on, if, if this was a concession that was so clear, why was preliminary issue number six posed at all? Um, well, um, uh, we, um, we, we... I can assist you with that. Um, if I can just take you to um, 03236. Um, we, um, we invite His Excellency to include that question. Um, and you see my, uh, the, the submission I made here. We made a post-termination payment and we say that extinguishes those claims. Those claims are still in his particulars of claim before the court, notwithstanding what Mr. Khalifa has told you today about bringing those employment claims. So it was still an issue for determination. Well, would you wait for a second? I'm not with you. For some reason, my pages are about two out. Um, what's, what phrasing am I looking for in the transcript? Yes, you're looking for um, Mr. Kemp and then... I say we made a post-termination payment, and we say that extinguishes those claims. What, what, what page are we again? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I've, I've lost you. So, what page are you in? Oh, page three, uh, what, three one nine nine, is it? No, zero three two three six. Um, I'm two, just doing three three six. Two three six. You have gone down so far. Okay. Zero three two three six. So this this starts, Your Excellency. We also want to include questions two and three on page twenty. Uh, is that's that the passage I'm looking at? Yes, Your Honour, that's right. And is question two the same as issue six that we now see? Yes. Okay. And so thank you. This passage deals with the. The formulation of that issue, and um, so we 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 say um, that the, the claims are still in his particulars of claim before the court, notwithstanding what Mr. Khalifa has told you today about bringing those employment claims. Um, so it, it, we we heralded reliance on the concessions in the court of that issue, but the issue had to be formulated um, because um, the. the the, um, the, 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 the claims were still in his particulars of claim. And so we, we formulated the issue with the intention of relying on the concessions in order to then seek dismissal of, the, of those claims at the, at the trial on the preliminary issue. Um, and that's what we did, because we then relied on the concessions in the skeleton argument, um, but also in the transcript. And if I can take you to the trial transcripts. Um, so that starts at 031. And the passage I want to take you to, Your Honours, is at um, 03109. Well, can, can you cite me the, the page number, the bundle page number? The bundle page number. 03109, Your Honour. Zero three 
and um, it starts with he takes the concessions in open court that nothing further is owed to him, as your excellency will recall. Do you see that? 03109. Yes. And I go on to take His Excellency to the concessions that were made at the CMC um, in the following pages. So 03109, 03110, 03111. Yes, slowly, slowly. I get sorry to be. Excellency asked in between, okay, there'll be employment and that man, yeah. 111. We're not coming, I'm going to be saying, true. Uh, the position, yeah, okay then. And okay. We, get the, we get to the bottom of um, 03111, mm. and um, I, I conclude by saying the defendant's entitled to rely on the plea of case. And the claimant's reply in defence of the counterclaim that there's no shortfall in terms of what he's owed under his contract because of the termination payments and entitled to rely on these concessions we, we have made in court before your excellency, which are concessions, concessions entirely consistent with the key position in the reply in defence of the counterclaim. So express reliance on these concessions made um, before his excellency below um, and Furthermore, if you go to 03113 at the top of the page, I, I submitted um, the pleaded position in the reply in defence to counterclaim and the conceded position at the CMC is that nothing more is owed. Therefore, there is nothing left and the breach of contract and penalty claim may fall to be dismissed. So express reliance on uh, the concessions made that nothing more is owed on the contract and um, penalty under the uh, DIFC employment law um, in reliance on the concessions made at the CMC. I now want to move, uh, Your Honours, to the judge's treatment of this part of the case and we go back to 0110 0110 oh, 110 110 110 okay 110 yes and his treatment of this issue um, starts at paragraph 20 of the judgment he begins by saying the defendant submitted that by making these payments, they extinguished any liability they may have to the claimant for breach of Article 64 of the operating law. The exact basis upon which this is alleged is not clear in either the pleadings or in submissions. No such submissions were ever made before His Excellency by myself. Of course they were not, because this was an outstanding liability under the contract and the DIFC employment law that had nothing whatsoever to do with the separate and distinct issue of construction under the operating law. And so the judge, we say, fell into error by mis misrecording and representing the submissions made by the defendant on this issue. He then, at paragraph 21, 22, uh, 21 and 22, goes on to erroneously conflate this issue with Article 64 of the operating law. Um, and um, we then get um, at section 20, paragraph 24, whether the collective payment extinguished any further liability for penalties after Article 18, it's not a matter I can determine on the evidence before me. The claimant contends that he remains entitled to a bonus payment of a bonus from the defendant, at least part of this issue is only capable of determination upon hearing the evidence and would also require me to consider some of the more substantive issues between the parties. 
And what, what, the, what His Excellency did there was effectively unpick the concessions made by um, uh, the, the claimant at the CMC by uh, permitting him to pursue the contention that he remains entitled to payment of a bonus and that there was therefore a, a substantive issue in that regard to go to trial. And that conclusion, we say, was clearly an error because the claimant had made um, clear and unambiguous concessions. No application had been made by Mr. Bowden, who was then representing the claimant at this trial, to withdraw the concessions. And the claimant was not entitled, we say, to unilaterally resolve from them. Um, I, 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 in my supplemental skeleton argument, I have referenced a few cases from various jurisdictions on the nature and meaning of concessions in civil litigation. Um, there isn't a great deal of authority out there on this, um, but if I may just um, take you to a few of those cases um, to conclude um, the submissions on this issue. Um, and if we start in Australia with the case of Coopers um, in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, and um, if I take you to 3B5, 3B5, I don't have 3B5. What, what do you mean by 3B5? Um, so if you go to the um, authorities um, part of the e-bundle, you should find that 03B-5 or 03B-1 is Coopers, the case of Coopers. Coopers and Pan Feeder. Yeah. Um, the one this, Mark in Green. The one Mark in Green. It's Cooper's Brewery in Panthida, um, Your Honour. Three B dash one. Yeah. Cooper's Brewery. Yes, Your Honour. And the, the, the passage I want to take you to, uh, Your Honour, is that of um, Chief Justice Rogers, um, and it's at um, 3B-5, or um, 742 of the case. The, the one marked in green. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, and the um, statement there, admissions are required for the purpose of ensuring that the court is called upon to determine only questions bona fide in dispute. And um, we then get um, at 3B13, um, the last page of that authority, um, the competing policy considerations on withdrawals of submission, of, of admissions. Um, an admission should not be permitted easily to be withdrawn so as to make the procedure meaningless. And on the other hand, the party should not be discouraged 
from making admissions out of fear that once given they cannot be withdrawn. Um, and so the, 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 the court there gives um, some guidance on the, na on the nature of, on role of admissions um, in civil litigation. Um, we then get a decision of the full court in Jeans, which is the next authority in the bundle um, at 3D14. And the relevant, the relevant passage I'll take you through is highlighted at 3B17, which follows what Chief Justice Rogers and Cooper's the party should not be permitted easily to withdraw an admission as otherwise the making of an admission might become meaningless. Nevertheless, the countervailing policy uh, that a party not to be discouraged from making admissions out of fear that once given they might not be withdrawn. And then we get further down uh, the page at paragraph 18, his honour accepted the principles stated by Santo J of the Supreme Court of New South Wales in Drabsh. And then we've got the citation there at one uh, in particular, where a party under no apparent disability clear and distinct admission which is accepted by its opponent and acted upon for reasons of policy and the conduct of the business of the court an application to withdraw the admission especially at appeal should not be freely granted and so we place reliance on that um, that this was um, these were clear concessions made by the claimants uh, relied upon by the opponents and acted upon in submissions. And the claimant wasn't entitled to unilaterally resolve from them. And, and his excellency was not entitled to effectively unpick that concession by allowing um, the issue on the bonus claim and the penalty thereon to proceed to trial. Um, there's one final case in this area of procedural law, um, which is Scotland. And the next case in the authorities bundle is called Promontoria um, and Wilson, um, 3C1. It's a Scottish appe Sheriff Appeal Court decision. Um, but we get at 3C8, um, at paragraph 1, the highlighted passage there um, on uh, the nature of a concession. And uh, that a concession becomes an integral part of the conduct of the litigation. And over the over uh, at three C nine, um, the um, appeal court goes on to say um, concessions may be made in writing or more often as in the present case orally. Concessions may emerge at any stage in the course of proceedings. They may relate to minor or major matters. They are important because by their very nature, they play a role in determining the conduct of the litigation. In particular, the party who is the beneficiary of the concession may conduct the litigation on the basis of the concession. Now, we rely on that to say that's the case here, that the, the claim was bound by his unwithdrawn concessions that he was not bringing a claim for sums under the contract, raised the bonus or the DIFC employment law, um, which embraced any Article 18 penalty thereon. And the judge was wrong to unpick that concession. The concessions should not be um, treated as a, a, a shifting, movable target that can be uh, resolved upon and withdrawn at will by a party. Once the concession is made and relied upon um, by the opponent. It binds unless there's an application 
to withdraw it, which there wasn't in this case. And so the judge was in error in allowing the, the, the substantive issues on bonus and penalty thereon to proceed to a trial. He should have dismissed the claims in our submission. Um, Your Honours, that deals with issue three. Um, I um, now propose to deal with issue four, which is the penalty point. Uh, it's a reasonably short point um, on the judge's reasons. Um, and so if I take you now to um, back to the judgment and um, the judge's conclusions on penalty, if we go to page one five of the bundle, please. One five. Paragraph three on one five. This is declaration on this issue. I'm unable to fully determine whether the collective payments made to the claimant fully extinguish liability for damages by reason of breach of contract or penalty under Article 18 of the employment law. So. Uh, fully extinguish contained an express conclusion that there was a liability in respect of penalty in the first place in our submission. We then get paragraph 23 of the judgment, which is at 110 of the bundle. Um, similarly, in relation to the Article 18 penalties, the fact that the defendant fails to make payments due to the claimant within 14 days of termination of his employment, therefore giving rise to penalties, dot, 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 that also contains a clear conclusion that the judge did find a liability for penalty. Um, the next paragraph at 24, whether the collective payment extinguished any further liability for penalties, again, contains a clear conclusion that the judge did determine that there was a liability in respect of Article 18 penalty. And the short point of law on this ground is that these holdings simply cannot stand absent any finding of fact as to the effective date of termination. An Article 18 penalty only arises if payments are not made within 14 days of the termination date. And if a court does not make any finding as to the termination date, how can it make any, any sustainable conclusion that there is any liability for penalty under Article 18? And on a fair reading of the judgment as a whole, no such findings were made, whether express or implied, as to when the effective date of termination occurred. And so uh, that... Mr. Kemp, Mr. Kemp, that might be a reason for reading the reasons, and in particular the declaration, as not being pregnant with the existence of a liability, but rather saying uh, extinguish liability if any well in other um, words judge really left the entire matter open one does need to construe the uh, what what his his excellency said i suppose if if that were the right construction that would remove your difficulty would it not um, Your Honour, I see that, um, but it, we, we, that, that construction um, doesn't fit with the, the language he uses in the declaration um, and in his conclusions that I've taken you to, where he, he, he speaks in terms of fully extinguished, further liability, and we get at paragraph 23 um, the fact that the defendant failed to make payments due to the claimant within 14 days of termination of his employment. Um, we, we say that on a fair construction of the judge's reasons, 
does demonstrate that he had held there was a liability in respect of Article 18 penalty. Um, and that's unsustainable, absent any finding as to the termination days. Um, well, well, nonetheless, let me go back to my point. Um, you rather reject what might have been a lifeline. If the right construction is not, as you say, but rather His Excellency did leave the question entirely open, uh, do I understand it correctly that that would satisfy your position? Well, it would be it would be one answer to to that. Um, we 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 would um, we, we we obviously uh, our um, position with um, issue three is that that, that the, the the claim um, in respect of penalty cannot go any further because of the concessions made and the post termination payments. Um, but your honour, I do see that. Um, your point that the, the reasons could be read in a, in, a, in in that way. Um, um. Well, they're related. If if uh, it is ex if your point about the concession is accepted and given effect, then there just could not be any further yes. question. Your Honour, that's right. You don't even need to consider this issue if you're with us on the concessions um, point. Um, well, we'll. You would need to consider it only in, only in the sense of whether or not um, His Excellency's judgment, uh, I suppose, was, uh, if we accept your submission, it was also an error in possibly contemplating the existence of a liability. The two go together. Um, Yes, um, but it, it, it may be, um, um, if your analysis of the judge's reasons is, um, is one that, that, that you, you, that you um, find, um, then the issue as the penalty becomes academic if you're with us on um, issue, issue three and the concessions point. Um, no, but if, even if we were not, let's assume we were not with you on issue three, if nonetheless the right construction is that the judge left entirely open the question of existence of any liability, in other words, did not decide it at all, then that would leave it a matter for the trial. That's, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Um, but, Thank um, you. Um, Your Honour, if I, um, just one small point on um, the, the penalty issue, um, there is one, um, apparent finding that's made by the judge at section uh, paragraph 27 of the judgment at 0111 paragraph 27 um, the judge says um, in agreeing that the contract was terminated and making no effort to continue his employment, the claimant must have waived the contractual requirement for notice by way of registered letter. So the judge appeared to find on an unspecified date that the claimant had agreed that his contract was terminated and made no effort to continue his employment. Um, we say that there wasn't any evidence before the judge to support that apparent finding. It wasn't contended for by the claimant in his pleaded case. Um, and so it wasn't open to the judge to, to make that, that finding, um, that apparent finding. There's just a short point there um, uh, to conclude um, ground three of the appeal. Um, your Honours, uh, that then leaves issue five, uh, which is the um, counterclaim points. And if I can begin those submissions by taking you to Damak and Ward, um, which is at 0220. And the relevant passage is that of um, Chief, the former Chief Justice Michael Huang at 0240.
paragraphs 139 and so on. And this is where the court considered the right to restitution pursuant to Article 48 of the Damages and Remedies Law. And um, we get at 142, paragraph 142, uh, the notion of unjust enrichment comprises two elements. Firstly, the party which restitution is sought against must have been enriched. Secondly, enrichment must be tainted by an unjust factor. And the Chief Justice then considered at 143, uh, the grounds of mistake and, and holds that, that, that that ground is not made out. Now, we're not relying on that ground of restitution in this case. Um, but then uh, the uh, <coughs> Chief Justice at 144 um, goes on to say the only other relevant ground for establishing a right to restitution is if Damat Park's receipt and retention of money is the result of some wrongful conduct on its part. Although the law on what categories of wrongs would justify restitution is in flux, that controversy need not uh, detain us because on the facts, Damat Park is not guilty of any wrongful conduct. Now, we say that that part of um, Damat, uh, paragraph 143, permits a claim in restitution where the payment is made voluntarily. Um, and that's the ground pursued in the counterclaim. Now, the wrongful conduct is the retention of monies that the claimant is not entitled to in respect of or arising out, out of his notice period because he was lawfully dismissed in accordance with his contract. Now, the judge ruled that the employment contract was terminated under clause three of the contract and he made a declaration to that effect in the judgment and the effect of that, the logical consequence of that conclusion in our submission is that the termination was therefore lawful under the employment contract um, based on that conclusion and declaration made by the judge. Now, as all the termination payments owed to the claimant pursuant to his contract had already been made to the claimant on termination, he was not entitled to any further payments in respect of his notice period or arising out of his notice period. Now, this point had nothing whatsoever. We have lost you. We have lost you. Your Honours, um, I completely dropped out of the um, of the hearing. Then um, it just simply packed up the Skype. Um, uh, your, your last words were, "This has nothing whatever to do with the separate." Your Honour, thank you. Uh, with the separate and distinct issue of the claimant's rights under the operating law, and you may see in the um, respondent supplemental skeleton argument, he make some points about that but it, it, it really was, was has nothing whatsoever to do with the operating law it has everything to do with the um uh, right to restitution and the um, um the um the, 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 the point um that the, the the point um on this ground is that the counterclaim um, was defended on an extremely limited basis. And we get uh, that at 0248, Your Honours, of the bundle. 0248. Um, 
Mm. Um, the basis, the, the the basis on which the the counterclaim was defended was simply that the claimant denies that it can ever be considered he was unjustly enriched by the payment, as he was entitled to such payment in terms of the DIT Law Number no. Five, two thousand and five, and the contract which the defendant elects to follow when dismissing the claimant. Now, as the judge had, had concluded and declared that the claimant had been terminated in accordance with Clause 3, and therefore his termination was lawful under the contract, there was no longer any tribal issue having regard to the limited nature and scope of the defence. There's no further entitlement notice pay under the contract. Uh, related end of service payments or to any penalty arising thereon. And so we say the judge should have entered judgment for the appellant on the counterclaim in respect to this issue and was wrong to refer it to trial because there was no tribal issue, nothing further for the defendant, uh, the appellant to prove in respect to the counterclaim, bearing in mind the limited nature of the defence to that claim. Um, so there it is, uh, Your Honours. Those are the appellant's submissions on the appeal. I need to do my microphone. Uh, if any further assistance to Your Honours, I think that covers the ground in respect of the four grounds of appeal. Uh, shall we continue to hear Mr. Bowden or anybody requesting for a short break? No. Uh, Mr. Bowden, how long are you going to take? Ooh, two, two hours, two sir. Hours, two hours. If that's so, I would like to request for a short break, 20 minutes maybe. Yes, sir. I, I've got <laughs> my own IT issues. I borrowed my colleague's uh, computer, which I can't carry on with. So, so can we take a 20-minute pause, please? Please. You want to, yes. Grateful. Yeah. Mr. Bowden. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Um, so, is, is Mr. Kemp online? Um, I'm not sure uh, if Mr. Kemp is with us. Yeah, is Mr. Kemp there, please? Mr. Kemp, are you with us? Your Honour, yes. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Thank you, sirs. Um, just, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we received a message from the registrar that the, the preferred method of proceeding, I think, is to use the find function um, and the, to direct the court uh, to the pages. Uh, is, is that correct, Chief Justice? That's what you want. Uh, I would rather, if you can project uh, the, as it is now, Mr. Barton is directed to page, and then do you want to go there and say yes? Right, yes. And I just go there, and it comes out like that, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to punch in the number, the page number, and sometimes I've got to wait for it to... I would rather you punch in and we just follow the... Thank you, sir. Um, and I think if you go to the uh, taskbar at the top, uh, the menu at the top, and if you go to find, uh, and then there's a, a yeah. button over just below the word redactions, which says auto direction, mm. I think if you turn that on, um, that, that will assist the process of uh, yes. redirecting. And yes, I got it. Yeah, last, last time we, I was here, sir, um, I, I was using the present function, 
but I, I wasn't really sure that it that it worked that well uh, in hindsight. And if, if this is a better way, I'm, I'm very happy. Yes, please. Okay. Well, I think in, in that case, uh, Suze, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm Roger Bowden. Uh, I appear for the respondent, Bassam uh, Khalifa. I'm uh, as ably assisted by my colleague, uh, Mr. Anshul Kalra, um, who has been uh, very involved in, in this case and, and will be going forward. I, I think, sirs, if it might be of assistance if we actually just look at the legislation itself. And I've, I've gone to um, Article 64 of the operating law, DIFC operating law. Um, and if we, and it's really looking at, at this retrospective uh, submission. Now, the first thing about this retrospective submission, maybe Mr. Kemp will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there's nothing in the judgment about uh, the retrospective effect, and it, it wasn't. Um, uh, dealt with in the court below, uh, to my recollection of matters. And indeed, it, it, it appeared very faintly uh, in the leave submission. Um, not much was said about it in the supplementary skeleton, and, and today it's, it's, it's emerged as the, um, uh, as the main case. And, and it, it just doesn't work. Um, and if we come down to Article 64.3, the Article 64.3, Three C um, says it, such person, and that's a person who's made a, a complying whistleblowing complaint under Article 64, shall not be dismissed from his current employment or otherwise subject to any action by the employer uh, which is reasonably likely to cause detriment to the person. So, so the part with the time with this section upon which this case is entirely based. Uh, almost entirely based, I'll come back to that, uh, is, is section 64.3c, and, and it's agreed that this Act came into force uh, in November of 2018, uh, and, and this uh, man was certainly not given any notice of dismissal at any time uh, prior to the 18th of December of the same year. So it's, it's six weeks uh, this, this legislation had been enforced for six weeks uh, at the time that the dismissal was made. And, and all that would be necessary to, to overcome my learned friend's argument is, is for him to make the point again. Uh, and he did. Um, that is the evidence. Uh, in, in January, uh, Stevenson Harwood, right, acting for him, um, wrote a long letter uh, repeating his whistleblowing uh, allegations uh, to, to Swift. Uh, and that occurred in, in, on any basis prior to the final dismissal occurring. So all, all that would be needed um, to overcome the problem, if it existed, which, which it doesn't, uh, would be a repetition of the matters and voila, you are a whistleblower all over again. Um, and, and so, but, it, but it's the dismissal uh, which uh, invokes the legislative response. And then if we just come up to Article 40, oh, sorry, before I move on from that page, sorry. the protection set out is a prohibition on dismissing a whistleblower. So when one t talks about the interplay between a protection and, and the genus is this is whistleblower protection legislation. Uh, it is whistleblower protection legislation in the UAE, uh, in England, uh, throughout Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, and many countries throughout Africa. Uh, it's, it's known generically as whistleblower protection legislation. And indeed, this is precisely how it's described here. So the protection in Article 64 uh, and the particular type of protection which is being visited by Article 64.3c is a prohibition uh, on the dismissal of a whistleblower because Article 64.3c says exactly that, shall not be dismissed from his current employment. And so uh, I'm sorry to say, but my, the distinction upon which my learned friend has, has based his entire case, it, it simply does not exist uh, because the protection is a prohibition. 
And if we come up to Article 40, I'll just scroll up. It's probably easier. He, Mr. Kemp's argument, as I understand correctly, I understand mm -hmm. is that when the when the statement of whistleblowing mm. was made by your client, the law was not enforced yet. Yeah. So if he, the law is not enforced when he made that uh, whistleblowing statement information, then he is saying that you cannot now enjoy that protection given by the law. That's what he's saying. So right. it goes on the interpretation of the law. If right. it acts retrospectively, then your client enjoys the protection. If that law is to be read for the future, on the day the law comes uh, into force and thereafter, anybody who provides information on the wisdom protection uh, uh, covered by the law enjoys that protection of not being able, uh, not uh, being liable for dismissal. That is the argument. So I, if, I, you can, I if you can, you can, uh, you can stick your argument to that. I think it will make life easy for sure. everybody. Well, all, all that needed to be done, and, and which was done, uh, was a repetition uh, of the allegations or of the complaint after the 12th of November uh, 2018. That, that cures the problem altogether. It's, it's a continuing uh, complaint w which is made. So if he repeated it, which he did, and there's a letter from Stevenson Harwood, it's, it's not here, but I can, I can send it through um, in January of, of 2019. Uh, well, problem, it, it's cured. But in any event, my, my learned friend's point is, is misconceived because what the legislation under 64.3c does is prohibit the dismissal. And it is the dismissal which must start after the date of the assent of the legislation. Uh, and it was some six weeks after the date of the assent of the legislation, sir. But so, you are therefore saying that, that irrespective of when the statement was made, yeah. if the act of dismissal take sorry, uh, Irrespective of when the statement, a whistleblowing statement was made, after the law comes into force, a person cannot be dismissed. Correct, sir. Because the oh. act of dismissal takes place after the law of coming to force of the, sorry, the date of coming to force of the law. Precisely, yes. sir. And all that was necessary is that he be a whistleblower on that date, and he was. The next point, <coughs> sorry, and, and just, yeah, without repeating myself, this this is a this is a late comer to the uh, uh, to the case. Um, uh, this retrospective point, um, it, it may have turned out to be the best one, but it's it's not. Um, it's it's not going to make a difference. Now, if we, I'll, I'll now direct you to the next page, which is the orders for compensation, Article Forty. And I'm hoping that that's flashing up on your screen now. No, no. Can, can you first, before you progress, Please. Mr. Bowden, can you develop that argument that I put to you just now, that the law applies to your client even though the whistleblowing statement was made prior because his dismissal took place after the, the commencement of the act. Can you develop on yes, that sir. argument? Yes, because the protection which the law provides and, and indeed the prohibition which the law condemns is the dismissal of the whistleblower. That's what the law is doing. It's pro it is prohibiting the dismissal of a whistleblower. And as long as that occurred after the date of the assent of the legislation, uh, that is all that matters. Uh, he was a whistleblower on that day. He had made a, a number of complaints. Um, 
my learned friend breaks it down into the first, second, third, fourth disclosures, but, but really they were continuing disclosures, uh, and he could repeat them at any time uh, and comply uh, with the rule that my learned friend uh, purports to create, which I say doesn't exist. I think the Chief Justice's question might be answered better if you address the argument which turned on the present tense if the whistleblower makes. That's, that, that is uh, as much an argument as the retrospectivity argument, and perhaps if you have some answer to that, I'd like to hear it. That, uh, we're coming back down to section 64.2, sir, are we? We are. Sorry, I'll, I'm just going back down to it myself, sir. Apologise. So, for the purposes of Article 64.1, the disclosure of fact made by the person shall, um, and, and so at the top of 64.3, where a person makes a disclosure under Article 64 brackets 2. Yes. Well, well, with respect, sir, I think the same argument, the same argument applies. Uh, it is the dismissal which is caught by the legislation, uh, not the not the prior making of the dis of the disclosure. Can 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 you read can you read that provision regarding dismissal? What does it say? Yes, sir. Uh, what does it say? Sixty-four three C says. What does it say? Any such person, and that is somebody who makes a disclosure, as Justice Giles has pointed out, such person shall not be dismissed from his current employment or otherwise, or, or otherwise subject, shall not dismiss. Be dismissed from his current position. From his so current the position. This uh, question, uh, Mr. Burton, I think is. Um, where a person makes a disclosure. The argument was, makes is in the present tense. Present tense means that it only starts to operate when the legislation starts to operate, so it is only disclosures made after the legislation is in force that can trigger the protection. Now, that may or may not be correct, hmm. but haven't, you haven't attempted to address it, and if there is something you would like to say to address it, I'd like to hear it. And I think the Chief Justice would also. Yes, sir. Well, it's a continuing state of affairs, sir. So it, it is not necessary to identify a date upon which it was made. It ha simply has to be made at the date of the dismissal. That has is the date of the chance. It has to have been made, is really has what to you're have saying. been made, correct, sir. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. so, and, so, in other words, effectively what you're saying is that those words should be understood as where a person has made a disclosure, no matter when, before yes, or after. That's, yes, that's your submission. Okay. Yes, sir. Is there any particular reason for saying that that's the correct submission? Yes, sir. Correct because what the legislation specifically prohibits is the dismissal. And otherwise, sir, it just it, it, it introduces an uncertainty uh, which cannot have been intended by the makers of the legislation. That we should have endless arguments about when this protected disclosure was made. Um, it is sufficient that it was made. Okay, uh, isn't this a form of a penalty imposed upon the employer uh, for uh, in that that uh, if the employee uh, makes such a statement, Yes. then the employer cannot dismiss him. And as we are all fully aware, a provision which is a bad penalty provision cannot act retrospectively. In other words, you cannot punish me 
today for something when I did or did uh, was not an offense or was not wrongful. These these offences, sir, the 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 subject of any whistleblowing disclosure, they can go back they can go back twenty years, sir. So it can't be based upon when when the underlying offence was occurred was made. Uh, yeah, no... to, to to take to take that argument to take that argument, can somebody who was dismissed for whistleblowing twenty years ago, now comes and say that he was wrongly dismissed? No, no sure. you can't. No, they cannot. But it's if the dismissal weird. takes place today, what you are saying is, if the dismissal takes place today for an act which he commits 20 years ago, that cannot be so. The, pr the, protection, of, the protection applies from the date that the law came into effect. Why do you matter. say so? Why, why do you say so? What, what's the policy behind this? Is that, what's, the, the, what's the reasons to support your interpretation? Well, otherwise, sir, you would have a, you would have a bright line um, when, which says that all, all corrupt acts after X date um, shall be shall be dealt with by by the whistleblowing uh, legislation. The the action what Mr Khalifa was complaining about, sir, it, it didn't occur even most of it within the UAE. It, it occurred in um, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, so so it, it cannot attach no, to the no, actual no, activity. No, no, no. Don't worry about the other countries. We are, we are interpreting right. as the law stands in the IFC. And the IFC, I don't know what the law in Sarja or something is not relevant. But in the IFC, you are saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm asking you a lot of questions because I'm thinking how to, what sort of interpretation to give to this provision to follow you or to follow the interpretation suggested by Mr. Kemp? That is why I'm asking you a lot of questions. Thank you. Perhaps, perhaps I, I, I'm sure there's, there's a better answer than I'm giving you, sir. I'm absolutely certain. And perhaps it's a matter for, for brief written submissions after this hearing. Um, but the answer in my respectful submission must be that as at the date of dismissal, was the officer aware that this person was a whistleblower? Okay, and and effectively, did they dismiss a whistleblower uh, at that date of dismissal? Was it a whistleblower they were dismissing? And the answer is yes. And and anyway, as I've said, sir, and, and we will certainly um, send it through afterwards. There's a very long letter from Stephenson Harwood uh, in January, uh, which sets out all of these complaints again. And so certainly, sir, by the date of the dismissal, which my learned friend Mr. Kemp has just said today is the 17th of February, um, they, they were well aware that they were dismissing a whistleblower. And he had repeated those allegations all over again in January, sir, curing any defect. All right. Shall we move? Do we move on, Mr. Burton, to uh, issue... Yes. Two, we were going or we have to issue two, or have we managed to get to three? <laughs> no, before before you 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 pr proceed, this is uh, the letter dismissing him. Uh, it was in, uh, in respect of which which of the whistleblowing that he has made. I know you are talking about correcting the defect, the curing yeah. the defect. When which statement? Was he charged that he was removed or rather dismissed for making the statement? It's now said, sir, that he was dismissed without cause, for, for no cause whatsoever. So he, he wasn't dismissed for poor performance. Uh, he wasn't dismissed for any dishonesty. He wasn't dismissed, apparently, for making no, a whistleblowing no. uh, complaint. Uh, he was just just dismissed without without cause. That That is the defendant's case, or the appellant's case. That this was a dismissal without cause, and what what we say flows from that is that if you dismiss a whistleblower, what, 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 what did the letter dismissing say? The letter dismissing, and what did he say? Shall we go and have a look? Shall we briefly have a look at those, sir? Because I, I I put them in because what, they, what did he say? Because to me, uh, 
this but this uh, ground is i mean you can mer- make a break on this ground you know so yes sir. if you can spend a bit you know uh, okay if we look at the actual uh, un- unfortunately sir there's there's no clear answer to 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 that no, question. Did, did, did he receive a letter uh, dismissing hey. him did he receive a letter that. dismissing frankly, him frankly sir the answer to that is no um <laughs> <laughs> so how do it's, you know how did he know he was dismissed well he's had to assume that he was dismissed his his payment oh, was his his last actual income uh, salary was the 17th of uh, february 2018 19 sorry last, last, sal- last salary was 17 february 2019 which is two months after he was given an offer of dismissal, if you can have such a thing. Ah, which was what, that, that offer, what does that offer letter say? Let's have a look, shall we, sir? Uh, I've got it right here. It is in... What does he say? He said, I'll, I'll direct you to the page. So without prejudice off of being removed. Um, can you now, are you now on page 05-33, 39? 39. 39, okay, 39. So without prejudice. Oh, yeah. So this was, this was what was sent through. Dear Bassa. I, want to, I must uh, object um, to this on the basis that uh, this is uh, one piece of without prejudice correspondence that's inadmissible. So that's point number oh. one. And that's how it was treated um, by the judge below, um, because at the CMC, he sealed it on that basis. And in any event, it's misleading okay. because there is a continuum of without prejudice correspondence. Um, and so it's not right to take the court um, to the document. Okay. Okay. If it is without prejudice, you cannot refer to it, of course. It, it, it's long you cannot refer to this, Mr. Bowden. Yes, yes, sir, but it's, it's not You cannot refer prejudice. to this. It's not without prejudice, sir. It can't be without prejudice. Yeah, um, but it's stated without prejudice and well, subject to contract. That's a label which was attached to it, yes, sir. Um, but with respect, it cannot be without prejudice because what it, what it proves, my learned friend's case, is that this man was dismissed by this letter on the 18th of December 2018. Um, The letter itself, sir, proves that he was not dismissed that day. And on that basis, sir, it could never be without prejudice. And and frankly, sir, what what, what was said... No, 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 no. Mr. Badr, Mr. Badr, look, if the letter is headed without prejudice, if you want to argue that, then you have to put aside under what bundle it is and... uh, uh, argue that, but you cannot erase it at this uh, appeals appellate stage. At that point. Well, the the answer then to to the question, Mr. Bird, as to whether. Sorry, sir. Um, uh, I know you're responding to the Chief Justice, but I I hope we don't get sidetracked into things which really don't matter for the question of statutory construction, which we're on about. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know that this really helps us on that. Okay, why, do, why don't we go to the next point? Yeah, the next point, sir. Uh, well, just on the next round, next this, round, next round. I, I think there is there is an important point, uh, particularly in relation to the employment claims as to when this man was dismissed. So we just looked at the 18th of December. Um, I, I think if we take the the ruling that the Lunar Chief Justice has just made, the fact remains that there's no evidence that he was dismissed. Uh, no admissible evidence he was dismissed on the 18th of okay. December. Okay. We're looking just, at something just, called... The... Just take it as that. Just take it yes. as that. Okay? Yes. Mm. Uh, if, I, if I now direct you to um, page 05-41, uh, that, that is a letter to him dated the 9th of January. Oh, sorry. I have to confirm. Sorry. I'm sending it to you. I'm giving you the uh, link now.
has that page arrived on your desktop? Yeah, 0541. Yes. yes. And if you look down there on the Monday, the 7th of January from a law fondue, okay, dear Bassam, um, and then in the absence of any feedback by Thursday, I will proceed with the normal termination process. So the, the, the next answer to that uh, is that he was not um, dismissed in January uh, 2018 either. So 19, my apologies, got to get that right. So he was not dismissed uh, by the 9th of January. And now if I take you to one more document, this is document 13 in that bundle. I've skipped over the actual settlement agreement, which was preferred to him. And if I direct you to that, and this is bundle five bar 51, And, and there, sir, um, this 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 email uh, assumes uh, that he had um, been dismissed uh, on the seventeenth of February mm. of two thousand and nineteen. I write regard following the date of termination of your employment on the seventeenth of January two thousand and nineteen. So. Frankly, uh, and this takes us back to uh, paragraph four of His Excellency's decision. Uh, when, when the judge says that there was no date upon which this man was dismissed and that it is a matter for trial, it, it most certainly is because there's a complete lack of clarity uh, as to when this man was dismissed. And, and certainly by the 19th of February, uh, by the date of this letter, uh, he had repeated many, many times uh, his, um, his claim of A, that I'm being discriminated against because I'm a whistleblower, uh, and B, I am a whistleblower, uh, and I've made A, B, C, D, E whistleblowing complaints which haven't been dealt with. So as, as, as to the, the, the point my learned friend wishes to make, it, it, it truly does disappear uh, in the face of the evidence. Although I do seek leave to, and, and I'll, I've got it on the email, and I can email it to Mather right now, uh, or otherwise upload it to this bundle, uh, to s send through the Stevenson Harwood letter from January of 2019, which does repeat all of these allegations again. And, and there are other documents which do the same. So I, with, with respect, if, if the point exists, that's the answer to it. Um, it was any any defect was cured, and at the date of what Swift say was the dis dismissal of this person, which was the 17th of February 2019, they certainly uh, knew all about the fact that he was a whistleblower uh, and that he was objecting to his dismissal on exactly that ground. And and given that what my learned, and we'll come to it sh shortly, we come to it now, paragraph 32 of my learned friend's uh, skeleton argument in the court below, uh, he says there, well, this 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 person was dismissed without cause. So what, what I'll come to later as well is what kicks in there is a presumption, if you dismiss somebody without cause, a presumption exists uh, that they were dismissed in retaliation for their whistleblowing. Um, no other but, reason. But uh, what, what, what is the system of contract? His employment contract. This employment contract, sir, was... Uh, what does it say about termination? It says, if we, I'll take you to that now. That's in that same bundle, sir. So it's bundle five, document one. And I'm just sending you the page direction now, sir. And if we go to article three, it, it's got um, the usual uh, boiler proof. Uh, boilerplate, sorry, uh, dismissal clause, um, that is article, no, sorry, clause number three. Um, have, have you got that page, sir? It is page It's coming down, it's coming five, in, it's, come, five, it's downloading. What does he say? Is 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 uh, mind? I don't know what's wrong. I'm not... 
Oh, well, what, what it's, it's, it's a, I think we call them a, a boilerplate clause. It, it says the duration of this contract is indefinite. Either of the contracting parties has the right to notify the other contract, uh, the other party of his intention to terminate this contract by means of a registered letter to be mailed to the other party uh, before the date of such termination. Uh, before the date of such termination, at least two months before that date. Okay, so what, what it says is that either of the contracting parties has the right to notify the other party of his intention to terminate this contract by means of a registered letter to be mailed to the other party before the date of such termination, at least two months before that date. Um, and then if either of the parties fails to fulfill this condition, the party shall be liable to compensate the other party with an amount equal to the pay due for the remaining part of the notice period set forth in this clause. And, and, and the judge found um, that, uh, that although no registered letter had been sent, um, that the two months notice period would kick in uh, from the date of termination, whenever that was. And, and we, we still don't know. I mean, he, he was marched out of the premises on the 18th of December, uh, and his cards were taken away, and, and he never never, stood, st never stepped back across the threshold again. Um, but uh, no effective notice of termination was given to him. Uh, his pay ran out on the 17th of February 2019, but as, as, as the counterclaim establishes, he was subsequently, in August of 2019, back paid two months, two additional months, which would have taken him through to the 17th of April. So we, I would say, sir, that his actual effective date of termination was the 17th of April, because in August um, he, he, he got another two months, plus mm. penalty payment based upon that. And, and that, of course, turned out to be the the uh, basis for the counterclaim and, and the claim for unjust enrichment uh, to get it all back. I hope I hope I'm making sense with this convoluted yeah. tale. But your client, your client, had been sub sufficiently compensated, isn't it? Wasn't it? He wants more than what he received. Ah, uh, he he got he got his two months, sir. From, from his last day of employment. That's correct. Mm. And, and that's, of course, what my learned friend says. He says, well, if uh, the, the um, I bet you enough. employment law enough. in the DIFC is pretty, pretty plain. You pay somebody mm. uh, their end of service, you give them their notice, uh, you give them their gratuity, uh, you give them uh, any outstanding holiday pay, uh, and, you, and you say goodbye. Um, that's right. And my learned friend says, "Well, well, well, that's it. We, we've we've done everything." Mm. Um, well, but your client wants something more on top of that and say he was wrongly dismissed. Well, well, my client says yes. The reason why you dismissed me is because I'm a whistleblower, or because I was a whistleblower. And but I but, but serious well, does, uh, if if I, as an employer, mm. invoke my right to dismiss you under that letter, term of the employment contract, does it matter what the motive of me disposing you, dismissing you is? What does it matter? I've given you a notice, I pay you according to the term of a contract. Sure. My motive is irrelevant. But for Article 64.3c, I would agree yes. with you, sir. Yes. Yes. That they, so they were. What, in, what, in more, fact, what more can you get under 64.3c? Ah, we can get the open-ended compensation, which is available to us under Article 40 uh, of of the uh, law, sir. I and so, that, that... if you dismiss a whistleblower under Article in breach of Article 64.3c you are then liable, and this is what the judge found, you, you are then liable to, compensation, to compensate that whistleblower under Article 40, mm. if, if you did it deliberately, intentionally, or recklessly, which, which we say they did. They knew all about it. 
They knew he was a whistleblower. He had made very serious allegations, which the chief auditor of SWIFT had himself uh, investigated and himself drafted the whistleblower complaint. Uh, had it been investigated for six months. Uh, there was a cover-up. Uh, the perpetrators didn't get into trouble. Uh, our, our client did, and he got dismissed for it. And, and, and these are root and branch schemes, sir, across the world, right, to stop Okay, okay, people. don't, don't, don't <laughs> talk about the world. Let, let, let's let's stick, well, stick to the IFC. May, may, I, may, I, may I interrupt here? Certainly. Yes. Um, um, Mr. Roger, are you suggesting that if under the U, under the DIFC court law and, and practice, if if you if you did whistleblower, uh, you would never uh, be dismissed uh, for for any other reason? No, another sir. Meaning, no, another sir. meaning, if you whistleblower, then the employer have no any choice to dismiss you um, because the fact that you did miss miss uh, whistleblower. No, sir. If, if I make a whistleblowing complaint to you now uh, and march straight out into the car park and break into your car uh, and I'm caught doing it, I, I would and I am dismissed for breaking into your car, I am properly dismissed and it would not matter that I was a whistleblower. Right, but this is, this is if you can prove in the first of all that the employer did uh, terminate his contract for that reason. Which is this well, matter of fact needs to be got to the trial and to be approved before the judge. I, I, I yeah, I agree that that's absolutely a matter for trial, um, and and it's certainly not a matter for summary determination here. But but what is what is very strongly in favour of of that proposition is the fact that it is admitted that this man was dismissed without cause, and and we say as a, as a matter of law, a presumption then kicks in uh, that he was dismissed for his whistleblowing. Uh, it's, it's not like there, there was anything. He, he was the top performing salesman in the MENA region, uh, nine years in a row, I, I understand. Um, even even in his most difficult year of work, which was his last year being 2018, he still uh, met all of his targets, succeeded targets, uh, two thirds of the year through way through the year. So he was a very high performing uh, salesman uh, for senior sales executive for this company. But none of this matters for present purposes. We have an exercise in statutory construction. We are yes, certainly sir. not deciding whether he was dismissed because he was a whistleblower. Yes, sir. So I agree with that. Can't get back to what matters. Okay, sir. Well, yes. Maybe Sorry. we have had to issue three by any chance. I, I, probably, I missed that. Sorry, sir. Have we got to issue three by any chance? <laughs> okay, Just go to issue T, Mr. Bowden. Remind me about issue three, sir. Um, issue three. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I genuinely am, am um, need reminding of that, sir. I, I should have written that down. That was the one where Mr. Kemp says uh, it was conceded that. There was no employment claim, nothing was payable, ah. uh, and should have been recognised and given effect by the judge. P precisely, sir. The, 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 the issue of the um, concessions. Well, well the, first, the first point is this, sir. This, this was a person, right, who was acting for himself at, at the relevant time. And if we go, um, if we go to the... To the uh, transcript ourselves, sir, um, and I think the first reference, this is, I'll just take you again to the page, it's bundle three at 110. This is this is this is me. Sorry. This is this is the um, this is the actual hearing on the seventeenth uh, of March, twenty twenty, sir. Um, the, and in 
sorry, I, I just, my, my learned friend, Mr. Cullen, has made this note while, while I've been gone. If I take you to, are, are we looking, sirs, at page 03 bar 110? Uh, we then get at, and I've highlighted these parts, we then get at page 298 an even clearer articulation of the claimant's position. You excellently, as he asked him, okay, but there are already, there to be already employment entitlements. Um, yes, there has been delay and they have sent me money later on. Are you claiming employment? No, I am not claiming employment. I am just claiming the damages. And then there's the, Again, so the judge asking him, okay, based on the operating law, and then we now get uh, 299 Law 64, which is precisely the claim that is now being advanced. So he, he was not, sir, abandoning um, the pleaded position, uh, which, which was, sorry, he was not abandoning the pleaded position, uh, which he had advanced in his pleadings at, at claim, sorry, paragraph or clause 38 of his statement of claim uh, that he was still due a bonus. He was acknowledging that he had been paid uh, his end of service entitlements and two months notice uh, and any outstanding holiday pay. He was acknowledging th those payments, sir, but he was explaining to the judge in that context uh, that he, his actual claim or his main claim was a claim under Article 64 uh, of the law. And then if we go down, sir, I'll just go across to my notes, sorry. And if I... This is how we addressed it in, in the first instance court, sir. And if I take you to, it's page 031-137, and I'll just direct you to that page. And, and here's myself, sir, making that exact point. Um, we accept right here and now that he got his notice, he got his gratuity, he got his holiday pay, uh, and, he got, and he got his outstanding wages eight months late. Uh, and he got a very big payment of penalty because they were so late. That is all fine. That makes no difference whatsoever to his claim under the whistleblower legislation. He was still dismissed because he was a whistleblower. Uh, then my learned friend went on in some length about the fact that this claim for bone about the fact that this claim for a bonus or commission payments, he said Mr. Bowden only raised this last week. However, sir, that is not correct because if we go into the next paragraph, uh, I did not submit it on it this morning, sir, because it is a bit of a sideshow to take up uh, your point, sir. Uh, when we are ready to recast the pleadings, I will seek a claim for unpaid commissions and unpaid bonus. I will seek a penalty for every day that has been unpaid equal to this man's last wages. I think AED 2,000 to 3,000 a day. So we'll get that as well. But the suggestion that this is somehow a new claim is just plain wrong. Because if we go to page 19 of the bundle, and if we go to paragraph 38, small Roman numerals three, it says there that what we are looking at, at is this, loss of bonus for the period following termination. So he had always, sir, at clause 38, small Roman numerals three of his particulars of claim had always claimed loss of bonus. And, and frankly, sir, nobody asked him uh, at, at the case management conference, are you now abandoning your claim for bonus under clause 38, small Roman numerals three of your particulars of claim? Uh, and if they had, the answer would have been no. It, it was no. And then, sir, I, I, I go on in the paragraph just to be, just below that to to address the issue. And I think there's a there's a DIFC case of Papadopoulos um, from Justice Steele, which and I, I'm sure there's a following case from Justice Giles, which addresses the issue of 
uh, of bonus payments uh, and the, the proper exercise of the discretion uh, when looking at bonus payments. And, and we say that this man is and was always entitled to his bonus commission because he was a high performing salesman uh, and there was not a proper exercise of the discretion when it came to looking at his bonus. So yes, he is entitled to bonus. Um, he's still entitled to bonus. It's still our unpaid uh, and still attracting a penalty uh, if the court uh, uh, applies that, which has also been claimed. Um, and, and it is, we have recast those pleadings. We have a draft particulars of claim uh, before the court, uh, in the registry, sorry. Uh, and when it comes to trial, we will seek exactly that. We've done exactly what we've said, sir. And, and I think that is a complete answer. Um, you can't take a, uh, a litigant in person uh, who was trying to explain to the judge the difference between the employment aspect of his, of his claim, largely satisfied, uh, and the whistleblowing aspect of his claim, uh, which was unsatisfied, and, and attempting to draw the court's attention to, to the whistleblowing part, bearing in mind that Mr Kemp repeated uh, just on auto repeat, this is an employment claim, this is an employment claim. That comes up maybe 15 times in the transcript. Mr Kemp saying, this is not a whistleblowing claim, it's an employment claim. The context of that discussion, sir, was, is this an employment claim uh, or is it a whistleblowing claim? And, and my client, acting for himself, was saying, it's a whistleblowing claim. Notwithstanding that there was a, a, a vestige uh, of, of an employment claim uh, left unsatisfied. I All think right. so, so, in other words, that, that's say how you say we should understand what was said at the CMC. That's your, that's your answer to Mr Kemp's submissions on the concession. You say that properly understood, there was yep. not a concession. Never been a concession. Yep. Is that a good summary? Okay. Yes, sir. Always pleaded, still pleaded. All right. Okay. And not satisfied. With any luck, that's issue three, is it, uh, Mr. Bowden? Yes, <laughs> And my learned friend, Mr. Keller, is going to tell me what issue four is. Ah, the, the conclusion on penalty and damages, sir. Um, Um, maybe, well, well, this comes down to what the judge said at article, at, sorry, paragraph 26 uh, of his decision. Um, and what, what we say about that, sir, is, is simple. With respect, the judge was referring to two instances in which Swift paid Article 18 penalties. Um, the judge was saying that he could not determine whether any further Article uh, 18 liability was due. And that's, it, it is indeed, uh, in the discussion with Mr. Kemp earlier, it was suggested that that's a matter for trial. And, and what, if any, Article 18 penalty is payable is absolutely um, a matter for trial. And the judge did not uh, determine the matter one way or the other. Um, and, and it all comes back, sir, uh, the reason for this uncertainty is provided by SWIFT, because they are quite unable to say uh, when they dismissed the respondent. Uh, it took place between the 18th of December uh, and, and the 17th of, of February, or perhaps even the 17th of April, uh, when his two-month salary ran out. And so if SWIFT are unable to say when they dismissed the, the respondent, uh, the judge was is completely excused for being unable to say uh, whether any Article 18 penalty uh, actually exists. Or is, is, is payable, sorry. sorry. Um, the next point, I, I really ought to, and I'll just, sorry, I'll just check my notes, but I really ought to take you to the to the part uh, in my learned friend's submissions where he says, and I think I made a note of it, if I can just check, sorry about that. I've, I've noted it, I'll have to come if you just bear with me for one moment. Look at the... The 
skeleton for the port for the court below. Sorry, Angel. The skeleton for the court below. Is that the skeleton. The skeleton for the court below. Sorry, can I just come back to that? I had it in my. I, I was planning, Sue, to go a different way about this. Uh, I apologise. Perhaps you just tell us the point you want to make. Yes, the point, sir, and I'm I'm just going from memory, but I'm pretty sure, sir, it's paragraph tw paragraph twenty two of my learned friend's submission uh, or skeleton argument in the court below, uh, and where it is said uh, as a a very bold submission, sir, that this dismissal was without cause. Now, what is your point, however? Well, well, again, sir, it comes uh, comes back to the um, Article eighteen uh, determination that if if the if Swift are unable to say when he was dismissed, the judge must equally have been unable to say whether any uh, Article eighteen penalty exists or not. And it has to be a matter for trial, which is dependent upon the resolution of the issue as to when this man was dismissed. I think you've said that at least twice, if not yes, more. I have. So let, let's not have it again. Let's not. Thank you very much. The next point. Well, do you? May, might I ask this, sir? Do you wish me to return to my skeleton arguments uh, and deal with the issues of, um, uh, well, particularly, sir, I, I would like to address you uh, on the DIFC consultation papers and the effect of that, uh, and the issue as to whether or not um, my learned friend had made earlier made the submission that this is a uh, solely an employment issue uh, and, and therefore no no compensation can be payable uh, under Article 40 uh, of uh, of this operating law, sir. Uh, do you wish to hear me on that point? How how is it relevant? How, how is it relevant? I can't see its relevance. But uh, I don't know what 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 just just uh, Giles has to say. Well, uh, how uh, relevant is it to you? Sir, returning to issue two on this on this point, I thought you had made your yes. submission. You can assume that we have read. In fact, yes. it is that we have read your okay. skeleton argument. If <coughs> right. You um, to just going through it. Anything additional or emphasis no. that would be useful as a matter for you? Um, as, as long as I've I've made myself clear in those in those documents, and I I hope I have. No, I don't have any more to add. Sir, um, uh, I, I was intending to repeat myself. You're right, sir. I have nothing else to say that I have not said in either the uh, skeleton argument dated the 10th of May uh, or the subsequent skeleton argument dated the 27th of August. That is our case. Okay, well, now, does, does, that, uh, does that include what you might want to say about issues? Four and five. In other words, you you have you're resting on what you have in your skeletons for those. I, I'm not saying you should say more, but it's entirely a matter of Yes. 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 Um, well, yes, sir. I have I have dealt very clearly. I hope with the um, uh, the issue of the termination on the contract. The judge was the judge was entirely right. Uh, and what he said there, uh, and also uh, I've mentioned there that the judge himself uh, read that contract very carefully. Obviously, he came up with the point about Article 16 uh, that all both parties to the contract are obliged uh, to uh, pay a, give effect to all of the uh, 
policies of the company. And one of those policies, sir, was of course the anti-corruption uh, and anti-bribery policy uh, and the code of conduct, uh, a key part of which was the whistleblowing policy, sir. So that, uh, and if there had been a breach of the whistleblowing policy, the judge therefore found that that would be a breach of the employment contract. Uh, and the judge, sir, was entirely right about that. Uh, we don't have any difficulty with any part of what the judge has said in this decision, sir. Um, it, it was uh, it was a, a, a uh, very professional, uh, well understood hearing. The judge asked a lot of questions. Uh, he hopefully uh, got the answers, sir. I didn't know then at, at that point in time. I myself did not know about the DIFCA consultation papers and how those papers uh, dealt, dealt with the issue of should whistleblowing be in the employment law, uh, should it be uh, in the company's law, uh, and the eventual decision to carve it out and put it in the operating law, sir, um, and, and, and the reasons which are stated there uh, for that. Um, I, I was I was myself, I I'm, regret to say, unable to uh, assist the judge in relation to those matters. And if I had been able to assist the judge in relation to those matters, um, uh, the judge would, well, the, the judgment would have been a, a lot stronger. But now that uh, when this appeal came about, sir, I did more research, I found those matters myself, and, and they are decisive, sir. Um, the, the DIFCA uh, intended, sir, to give effect to the OECD uh, paper or draft law on, on whistleblowing, uh, best procedure law, for, sorry, the, D, uh, the OECD 2012 paper on the best procedures for whistleblowing, uh, which was itself, sir, uh, developed from the G20 uh, directive on anti-corruption from 2012. And the, the papers themselves, sir, they say quite, quite clearly that this is the intention uh, of which have been brought into law. So really it, it is, there is a root and branch scheme, sir, and, and this is an integral part of it. Uh, and, and so therefore, and that brings in, I brought in the Waterhouse, uh, well, just in relation to DIFC consultation papers, sir, I have, Perhaps it might be useful. Uh, have you got the notes turned on on your system, sir? Because I could now take you to the authorities upon which we rely, uh, and very briefly, I have um, coloured up uh, those in orange. And if you turn on the notes function, um, I'll, I'll take you to each case um, in sequence. Uh, just getting back to this final point that uh, this legislation should be interpreted uh, in lockstep uh, with European legislation. And so on the right hand side, uh, there's the notes function, sir. Um, and my notes in, in relation to our authorities are in orange. And I'll skip the first uh, Royal Mail and Duty one but I'll come to the second if I may, and I'll s tell me if it's useful to you, and I will. Can and I just, uh, can I understand what you're proposing to do, please? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I'm, I'm I see to... we, we have uh, quite a number of authorities, um, yes. 15 of them. Um, I hope you're not intending to take us painstakingly through all 15. I've put together a highlights package, sir. Well, um, that doesn't answer my question. Are you proposing to take us to passages from all 15? Um, I had noted each, each particular one that I had put in, sir. I had briefly coloured up in orange um, in, in respect of each one. <coughs> so the answer to your question was yes. But if, if it's, I'm, I am entirely in your hands and you know that, sir. Just, just being given a list of orange passages is not terribly helpful. It might be better if you took your best few cases right. and explained why they assisted your position. Yes, sir. 
I'm more than happy to do that, sir. Uh, in relation to the preliminary points, His Honour the Chief Justice mentioned at the beginning um, that, that these preliminary points uh, didn't follow, well, well did, did not uh, attempt to isolate the facts upon which they were based and that there is no factual agreement uh, underpinning these, these questions, sir. And so the case of McLaughlin and Grover's affirm, uh, and, and in particular, uh, the decision of His Honour uh, Justice David Steele, as he was later Sir David Steele, uh, is, is almost the locus clacus, classicus of that. We have an appeal. There were questions posed. They have been answered. The yes, answers have been challenged in the sense there's an appeal against it. Yes. We've heard Mr Kemp in favour of the appeal. We've heard you in opposition to the appeal. Yes, sir. Why are we going to that? Why are, we, why are we going to whether there should have been any questions at all? Or well, more precisely, whether the questions were uh, done the right way? Well, I it is an Just to submit to cases concerned with the use of extrinsic materials. Do I have it wrong? Say that last bit again, sorry, sir, about extrinsic materials. I thought that since we were talking about yes. the use of extrinsic materials, you're going to take us to cases on that. Okay. Is that wrong? Well, in, in relation to, to, well, okay. I was going, because we were getting to the point about extrinsic materials, and because that involved a reference to authority, sir. I thought that I might cut to the chase and take you through all of the material, all of the authorities which I have, and then trouble you no further, sir. That that was my intention. I apologise if, if I've got Your off on the wrong foot. Unless there is reason to take us to the authorities. Okay. And since we seem to have got to the stage where what is left is su your support for use of extrinsic materials. Right. If there are authorities on that, let us have them. Yes, I will take you. In that case, sir, I'm, I'm looking at the decision of Justice David Williams of the DI, in the DIFC Court, International Electromechanical Services, at paragraph 116. And... Sorry, I'll take you to that, sir. And that is at page 06-116 of the bundle. And I will send a direction to it now, sir. Thank you. Yep. And you see paragraph 116 of that decision there, sir, um, and that, that all, all it needs to be said in relation to that, sir, is that uh, in that case, uh, Justice David Williams adopted exactly the same approach. Same approach, meaning having regard to consultation papers. Is that your point? Precisely, sir. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, and the next point that I would wish to go to is an allied one to that, sir, and that should be the decision of Waterhouse, sir, uh, Justice Sir Richard Field, uh, at paragraph. 144 of that decision, sir, and I will take you to that and send a directions invitation now. And I should have noted it up. There it is, sir. Paragraph 144. Um, I accept Mr. Pitpain's contention that in modelling the DPL on the DPA, uh, which was in turn the product of the European Directive, uh, it was intended uh, that the DPL should march in step, not only with the UK law, but also with the EU law. Um, as Mr. Pitpain pointed out, 
the first DIC data protection law enacted uh, contains in Schedule 2 a list of pronouncements which were taken into account uh, in the law's drafting, uh, included in the list as a European directive. So we're not in quite the same situation here, sir, but the DIFC operating law whistleblowing provisions were drafted to give effect to the OECD model law, sir, which was did arise from the G20 directive. Uh, and in my submission, sir, the same approach should be taken, namely that the interpretation of the whistleblowing law uh, should uh, take into account uh, relevant subsequent relevant changes in in European uh, and other uh, whistleblowing law, sir. Um, it's a it's a root and branch scheme. Uh, there, it's it's a perfect uh, situation, sir, for uh, comparative uh, for looking at, at comparative jurisdictions, uh, and therefore I, I have, sir. And I'm not sure if you wish to go to them, but I have also marked up the relevant parts of the EU directives. Um, and I've also marked up, sir, the Transparency International, which I accept doesn't have legislative force, but I say, sir, does represent best practice. Okay. And, and, and sir, I also say that those, those, many of those provisions are in fact reflected uh, in the DIFC operating law that we're looking at. My next point, sir. Well, that would have taken me to the transparency document, sir, and the EU document, if, if you wish to look at those. But if you've seen them, um, and I've marked them again, again sir, in the uh, orange tags, um, the principle 11, principle 20, uh, and then in the EU directive, sir, principles 21, 5, uh, Article 21.5 and Article 23 of the EU Directive, sir. If, if you, I, I can take you to them or otherwise um, those are the correct uh, references, sir. The references in my supplementary skeleton might have been slightly in this. I, I think you can take it. We'll be able to go to them and uh, certainly the highlighting will be useful. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, sir. I, I, I was thinking while, while you were talking. Do you wish to be taken to them or not? No, I, I was saying I think we will be able to go to them and the highlighting will be ah, useful. Thank, thank you. you, sir. All right. Now that brought us, sir, to the issue of this counterclaim is an abusive process. Um, and I'm not, not sure if you wish to hear from me on, on that point. Um, but it, it simply can't work, sir. Let, let, let me uh, perhaps leap in. Um, yes, I have not sure if my brethren take the same view, but I said, on my part, I don't wish to hear from you on whether it's an abusive process. I wish to hear from you on whether the appellant is right in his complaints about the judge's decision. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. You you have heard from me then, sir, um, on on with on those points. Uh, I I do stand on my um, skeleton arguments, which I think are hopefully uh, thorough. Uh, and if if there's nothing else that you wish to say, other than the last matter that I would wish to draw your attention to, um, is is the fact that we what what we would like out of this appeal, sir is A, for it to be dismissed, but B, we would, a desperate plea here sir, for, for some proper case management, sir, uh, which we uh, have regrettably uh, not been uh, receiving so far. And what I would ask this court to do is to appoint a, a senior uh, judge to actually case manage this case through to trial. Um, we have, uh, at the, our approach to costs, sir, at the end of this case, and it's subject to a subsequent appeal, so I'm not going to trouble you with it too much now, but we ask for costs on the same basis that the defendant said that they would seek costs, i.e. right back to the beginning. Um, it's the 30th of September now, sir, 
we put our cost submissions in on the 23rd of April. Uh, this should have been a summary assessment of costs under RDC um, 3833, sir, um, but it wasn't. Uh, and, and we've received a cost decision which effectively cuts our claim for costs, which will all to go to the defendant, sir, who is in a, a, a desperate situation. Um, that's cut that in half uh, and then uh, said that we'll get 50% of that after um, the matter has gone to detailed assessment. So we've filed for the detailed assessment. The bill before we can start detailed assessment is $16,770. Um, so he has to pay that uh, to kick off the detailed assessment. Uh, then, sir, he can make uh, a, a um, application, perhaps, uh, to get 50% of 225000 back. The economics, sir, are, are not and one one is in US dollars, the sixteen thousand seven hundred is in US dollars, and the two hundred and twenty two thousand is in Durham, sir. The economics of, of this aren't great, um, and he has got no money at all, sir. Uh, when we sent a letter to the Chief Justice about this on the on the twenty seventh of July, sir, and I have put those letters uh, in, in the in the bundle, sir, attached to the letter that we subsequently sent on the fourth of August to the Chief Justice, um, all we got was a bill, sir, for 300 US dollars again, which the claimant was unable to pay. Um, we, on the 4th of August, we, we did submit um, a fully um, restructured particulars of claim running to, regrettably, 55 pages. Uh, we put in uh, a very detailed uh, schedule, sir, seeking uh, document production, uh, and we also made a claim uh, for interim damages in respect of this matter. Uh, again, uh, the... the stop you there. Yes, we sir. are just this appeal. Yes, sir. Aren't we? Yes, sir. You, you don't I... just rush up to the Court of Appeal when it's hearing an appeal and start asking for all sorts of other things. If you want other things, there are ways of asking for them, but not this way. Point taken, sir. Okay. I, I was on my very last sentence. Okay. Um, well, I have nothing more to say unless there's anything more okay. that the court requires to thank hear you. from me. Thank you. And, Mr. and thank you very much for the opportunity. Mr. Kemp. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. We Your can't honest, hear you. Um, I have um, three points to make by way of reply. Um, the first yes, two yes. Are, are relatively straightforward. Um, one, so mm. many of the um, factual submissions around termination are simply irrelevant to the issues um, that this court needs to, to decide. Um, yeah. Mr. Mr. Jesse Shamlan's alarm, is it? Somebody's it's alarm. Who's fire alarm? Is that your fire alarm? It is, Your Honour. My, oh, Your Honour, my apologies, um, Chambers fire alarm test. Um, just at the wrong moment. Um, okay. So if yeah. I stop. Yeah. As, as long as it's on test, as long as it's on test, it's okay. Otherwise, you've got to run out of the building. Um, thankfully, okay. Your Honour. I think it was just a test. Um, so many of so the first point uh, by way of reply is that so many of the um, submissions around the termination are simply irrelevant to the issues this court needs to decide. But it is incorrect to say that the claimant didn't acknowledge his termination. It's well canvassed in both the pleaded cases that he did, both um, on the 18th of December and subsequently in email correspondence. And I don't intend to rehearse the statements of case on that. They speak for themselves. And um, the second point on concessions. Um, we clearly take a different interpretation to what uh, the claimant uh, meant um, at the CMC. And we say there the transcript is clear and speaks for itself as to what he was conceding. Um, and I've given you my submissions already on that. Now, that brings me on to the third point, which is the key issue, issue number one, um, whether um, the um, claimant's alleged disclosures fall within the scope of the operating law. And here, with the greatest of respect to Mr. Bowden, we heard a lot of beating around the bush on this point, but eventually he conceded that his interpretation required um, a considerable amount of words to be read in or reworked into the provisions and um, had been made, um, was his response to 
um, uh, Justice Roger, Roger Giles on, on that point. And there's simply no warrant for the court to do so. It's, it's not for this court to speculate as to the intention of the ruler or to legislate. Um, and it would be impossible to do so. The, the, the drafting um, makes a disclosure in both subsection one and three is absolutely clear and unambiguous. Um, the letter from Stevenson Harwood um, doesn't um, resolve uh, Mr. Bowden's difficulties on this point of construction. Um, this was a letter from Stevenson Harwood to Haddock and Partners, and it can in no way fall within the terms of Article 64.1, which is a person who makes a disclosure of information to the registrar, the registered person's auditor, or a member of the audit team, a director or other officer of a registered person. That letter was neither from um, Mr. Khalifa himself or to any of those um, uh, individuals named and prescribed in Article 64.1. Um, and so um, we're left with the, with, 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 with the reality that all of the alleged disclosures that may fall within the scope of Article 64.1 are all made before the law came into force, and therefore there's nothing on which um, the protection in Article 64.3c can bite. That's the short answer to the appeal on the operating law, uh, and disposes uh, of uh, the claim on that. We would seek this court to then dismiss uh, that claim. And so uh, that, those are um, my brief words by way of reply, unless I can assist you any further, um, Your Honours. Um, that brings the appeal to a conclusion as far as the appellant is concerned. Uh, okay, uh, gentlemen, Mr. Kemp and Mr. Bowden, uh, uh, I would like to have a few few minutes, five, ten minutes with uh, Justice, uh, my brother, brother judges. So we'll get out of this and we'll come back in ten, what, ten or fifteen minutes later. Okay? Of course, Your Honour. Right. Grateful. Your Honour, yes. Okay. Uh, we have decided that uh, we reserve uh, judgment and uh, we'll notify you of the date when we will be um, uh, delivering our judgment. Or as n normally is done, is we, uh, we issue the judgment to re re through the registrar. That is what is done in the, the IFC. We'll notify you of the date. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the good uh, submissions by both parties. And thank you very much to the judges for being very patient, Justice Giles and the Samran, and not forgetting the registrars and the people operating the IT for today. Thank you very much to everybody.